Hello everyone, this is Flashpoint History for the Armchair Historian. The folks over at the Armchair Historian are taking a bold step to create a website for history-related videos and content. The aim is to create a platform to aid in the democratization of knowledge without all the hang-ups of ads, sponsorships, or censorship, and to give history buffs access to content that may not appear anywhere else. Videos like this one will be posted on their site and will be accessible with a two-month free trial. If you're interested in being part of this educational experience, check out the Armchair Historian website. The link will be in the description of the video below. It was in the middle of the year 711 that two armies converged in the southwestern portion of the Iberian Peninsula. The first was a Visigoth force that was led by King Roderick. His people were an ancient line that were established in the peninsula since the time of the Roman Empire. The other was a Muslim army that was led by a commander named Tariq ibn Zayad. His soldiers, comprised mainly of Berbers, also came from an equally ancient beginning, but they were unified under a relatively new religion that had appeared on the world stage, that of Islam. The two contingents would meet near the banks of the river Guadalete, but unknown to both, the outcome of this confrontation would decide who would dominate what was once the Roman province of Hispania. The Visigoths were once an agricultural tribe that lived in what would one day be Romania. They were displaced by the Huns and took refuge within the Roman Empire. But perhaps refuge was too kind a word. The Romans exploited them and reduced them to the status of near slavery. However, the Visigoths rose up in rebellion and in the process destroyed Roman armies, killed a Roman emperor, and in the year 410, they did what no one had done for 800 years. They sacked the city of Rome. From then on, they would alternate between being Roman friend and foe, but eventually they settled in Hispania and carved out a kingdom for themselves. As the Western Roman Empire collapsed, their kingdom flourished, and along the way, they adopted Christianity. The Visigoth government centered around a monarchy that was for the most part elected by the nobility. Dynastic rule was tolerated, but somewhat sparingly, and the military was mostly comprised of militia that would be under the command of local lords. Thus, the transition from one king to another held the potential for civil war. But despite this, the kingdom would be surprisingly stable, and Visigoth culture thrived. That is, up until the year 710. King Watiza had ruled the Visigoth kingdom from approximately 694, but in the year 710, he died. The circumstances of his demise were shrouded with intrigue. Some claim that he had died of natural causes, where others say he was murdered. But either way, on the death of the king, the land, and the people were divided between two claimants for the throne. In the northeast, Achilla, who was thought to be Witiza's son, claimed the crown. But in the southwest, Roderick, the Duke of Baetica, also claimed this position. The historical records suggest that Roderick essentially usurped the role of being the next sovereign, and may even have had a hand in the assassination of the former king. The Visigoth kingdom was in a crisis of succession, but Achilla and Roderick never had a major confrontation. They simply didn't have the time. The very next year, a new threat would appear in the south. Nearly a hundred years before and far to the east, the Prophet Muhammad had united the quarreling tribes of Arabia with a new religion. Islam would flourish, and those who heeded its call were united under a new banner. From the Arabian Peninsula, the great Arab conquest began. In the span of almost a hundred years, the lands under Islamic rule would grow from a simple city-state to encompass a territory that would stretch from the Atlantic Ocean to the Indus River Valley. 
By the early 8th century, this caliphate, as it was known, would be ruled by the Umayyad dynasty. It was very soon after North Africa came under the Umayyad sphere of influence that the appointed governor of this province, Musa ibn Nusayr, began to receive reports of the disorder that was occurring in the Iberian Peninsula. Sensing a great opportunity, he ordered one of his field commanders to take advantage of the discord. Thus, he wanted Umayyad forces to cross the narrow strip of water separating Africa from Europe and begin raiding Hispania. This task would befall a man named Tariq ibn Zayad. He was a freed slave who had risen up through the ranks for his tactical brilliance. In April of the year 711, he embarked from the city of Sayuta with 7,000 Berber horsemen. He landed near the port city of Algeciras, but of note, off in the distance was a great mountain which would eventually bear his name, the Mountain of Tariq, or in Arabic, Jabel al-Tariq, which is where we get the modern name, Gibraltar. Tariq raided the lands within a relatively short distance of Algeciras. He wanted to keep his access to the port readily available in case retreat was necessary. However, his raids would prove to be very successful, and thus his presence was swiftly noted by the Visigoth. A military response was soon on the way. Meanwhile, King Roderick at this time was in the north campaigning near Pamplona. On hearing of the new aggressor, he disengaged his troops and began marching south. Along the way, he stopped at his capital, Toledo, to call on his nobility to bring in reinforcements. His nobles would join him, bringing along their own personal forces to enter into the fray. Then together at the head of this combined multitude, Roderick, his men, and his nobility marched further south. Now while this was going on, Tarek had kept his forces tightly leashed in, and on hearing of this incoming army, he requested reinforcements. Musa ibn Nusayr was pleased with the success of his raids and deployed another 5,000 men to reinforce Tariq. This brought the Muslim force to approximately 12,000 men, but this still paled in comparison to the Visigoth, which by the more credible sources numbered approximately 30,000. According to the chroniclers, it was in July near the mouth of the river Guadalete that the two forces finally met. The Muslim force consisted of mainly Berber cavalry with a small contingent of Arabs. They were experienced soldiers that were well equipped and had excellent morale. Through a series of military campaigns, they had learned to work well together as a fighting force. On the other end of the field, the Visigoth held the numerical superiority. However, many of these troops were either conscripts or slaves that were pressed into service. Most were poorly equipped and had almost no battle experience. Only Roderick's immediate entourage had some semblance of being a worthy adversary, and furthermore, like the Visigoth kingdom, loyalties were divided. Tarek positioned his men on the high ground of a hill which gave him a commanding view of the battlefield. There he waited. The Visigoth would send in one probing attack after another, but Tarek wouldn't take the bait. His well-disciplined men held their positions and refused to give chase. Meanwhile, Roderick, who was becoming impatient, ordered a broad frontal attack. He calculated that his weight in numbers would compensate for his enemy's better position. The Visigoth army advanced towards the Muslim position while maintaining their formation. However, as they got closer, the two flanks of Roderick's army, which was commanded by his noblemen, began to slow down. And then they came to a complete stop. But Roderick didn't notice this until it was too late. He had already ordered his men to charge up the hill and go directly into the enemy's center. When he finally had a chance to survey the situation, he was horrified to note that his flanks had not only stopped, but were now retreating. The divisions of loyalty within the Visigoth realm were now laid bare for all to see. It was even said that Tarek might have had a hand in bribing the Visigoth nobility into desertion. Whatever the case may be, Roderick's men, despite their valiant charge, were not able to dislodge his opponent's forces from the hill. 
Tarek, realizing what had just happened, continued to hold his center and then quickly moved to exploit his enemy's exposed flanks. He ordered his Berber cavalry into a double pincer movement. The horsemen came down the hill, gaining speed as they went. With their momentum, the Berber cavalry was not only able to hit the flanks, but went on to envelop the Visigoth force. Being attacked on all sides and with no avenue for retreat, Roderick's army was annihilated, and this as his retreating nobility simply watched on. The exact number of casualties is still unknown. Most chroniclers agree that they were very high for the Visigoth, but what is known for certain was that on that day, Roderick was killed. Tarek was also recorded to have suffered losses with the higher estimates in the 3,000 range. However, with this victory, he had seized the strategic initiative and began a full-scale invasion. The Visigoth, who had been demoralized and nearly politically decapitated at Guadalete, fled in terror, posing only token resistance. In fact, their capital, Toledo, which had been nearly abandoned, was taken just a few months later. Meanwhile, Musa ibn Nusayr deployed another 18,000 men from Africa and then personally joined Tariq. Together, these two men would begin a process that would subjugate nearly the entire peninsula. The Umayyad Caliphate would now have a new province that they would name Al-Andalus. But while they held dominance, they did not control everything. In the extreme north, in the Cantabrian mountains, a new Christian kingdom would be established, and it is from here that the reconquest would begin. Everyone, thank you again for watching. Again, videos like this will be available on the Armchair Historian website. This is going to be a website where a multitude of content creators from all walks of life have a platform to showcase their passion for history, a place that you can avoid ads and focus on learning. So hit that link in the description of the video below and begin your two-month free trial today.